Great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, welcome to this panel on uh, technology and elections and the judiciary. I think that um, technology, as we know, has been um, something that has had a great deal of promise, which we'll talk about today, but it also has many drawbacks, which you have to be mindful of. Um, let me start by saying just a couple of very quick things and trying to frame the discussion that I want to turn it to our panelists. Um, I want to say that the Election Integrity Project has been uh, fantastic in, in many ways. And, and one way in particular is that we've, uh, we look, I'm even saying we, like I'm part, uh, <laughs> that, that bringing practitioners and um, academics together has been a real strength of the Election Integrity Project and something that many have tried to do for a long time, uh, which this has been probably the most successful that I'm aware of. But one thing that I've always said, uh, uh, is that there's the academics of practitioners and we've we've not always included the legal community in a way that we probably ought to. I think many of the questions we look at, look at legal framework, interpretations, judgments, but we largely have not had the judiciary or the judges uh, or lawyers at these discussions. So I'm really, really happy about this uh, panel today. Um, just very quickly, my name is Chad Vickery. I'm the Vice President for Global Strategy and Thought Leadership at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, IFAS. Um, I'm joined today, and I'm very, uh, we're very privileged to have this panel today. Um, Honorable Justice Yergata Nimpar from the Court of Appeals of Nigeria. Um, Honorable Justice Musinga, who's the President of the Court of Appeals and Vice President of the Judicial Committee on Elections in Kenya a U.S. District Judge from Minnesota, Honorable Judge Thunheim, and a Senior Global Election Expert, Ronan McDermott. I think we will uh, discuss today uh, the role of technology in the judiciary and elections, um, but I think to frame that a little bit, I just wanted to say that um, I have seen throughout the, the 20 years or so that I've been doing this, that technology can have a lot of positive effects. If it's fit for perfect, per, uh, purpose, if there's time to implement technology properly, if there's funding to do so, and if there's a technical knowledge that an election management body or other has uh, to implement technology, it can have a great deal of benefit to the electoral process. There can be, um, it can increase speed, speed of election results. It can uh, bring ease to counting and, and accuracy in counting. There can be a, a more transparency there can be uh, uh, more trust and, and understanding of the process, but that is all contingent upon how it is implemented and used. Technology also has a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, as we all know, there's cybersecurity threats. There can be breaches of voter registries and results transmission. There could be a lack of transparency and people don't understand the technology. And all of these things losing candidates can use to try to disrupt the process or to bring distrust to the election system. And that's where we get to the discussion today. I think judges are often asked to jump in and try to correct these problems. But judges, as uh, we all know, are usually working within a system that's maybe hundreds of years old. The processes, procedures aren't specifically focused on elections many times. The, the evidence they have may not be perfect. The time that they're working with can be very short and difficult. Um, and it's just a highly politically charged environment. And now you're throwing technology into that process and all of the distrust that's come with technology and judges are put in just a very, very difficult situation. And I'm not sure we as practitioners uh, often really appreciate the role that judges are in and the difficulty they're facing and what they're being asked to do. Um, I do think recently, though, we have seen that uh, courts and the judiciary are coming in and making a profound difference in elections and election results from Kenya in 2022, the US election in 2020, most recently Brazil and Nigeria. I think um, judges are coming in and taking the evidence they have, making proper decisions and trying to support the electoral process in a way that brings trust in the overall system. But 
I do think there are a lot of challenges, and today that's what I would like to start to uh, discuss with the with the panel um, and try to bring in the experience of some of the judges uh, that they're dealing with these questions. And first, I'd like to turn to uh, Justice Masinga, um, and I want to talk about trust in elections and what you're seeing in regards to technology. The use of technology, I think, in Kenya with the results transmission system and the results process, but there's also disinformation. There's a whole army of issues uh, regarding trust in elections that you're dealing with. Um, what are the challenges that, that you're facing uh, in, in your court and, and how have you come to try to address those issues? Because I know over the last few years, there's been a lot of changes and, and, and progress made in that area. So what's your experience with trust in elections and technology? Thank you very much, uh, Chad, for your introduction and uh, the comments that you've made. And as you would like to say, uh, there are always questions to do with the trust uh, in modern technology. But I think in Kenya, it's uh, more of uh, uh, misinformation uh, rather than uh, the, um, uh, the erosion of, of trust. And let me say that uh, by and large, our election is uh, manual. It's only a few elements of it that are done electronically, like the voter identification, uh, all other processes, the voting, the, the, the counting of the ballots is done manually. But the presidential election results must be transmitted electronically to the national Tallying Center. Despite the fact that the, uh, the presidential election uh, uh, results have already been counted at the polling station, and the law says that the results that have been counted the polling, at the polling station are the most authentic, but there still must be transmission uh, from the polling station to the National Tallying Center. Now you find some parties making an allegation that the process of transmission, during the process of transmission, there was interference with the channel of transmission, whether it be the servers and so on, and some of them do not understand how these servers operate. So that in the last presidential election, and even in the other one, we saw allegations being made that the servers were interfered with, and it was not possible, um, it was difficult for uh, uh, the parties who are making that allegation to prove. And you realize that uh, there is a very short period of time uh, uh, that the courts have to determine or to allow parties to go into uh, observing the details of, of the electronic operations. In fact, some parties went to as far as asking that, that open the servers and they do not even know how what the server you know, looked like. And uh, we had to find ways and means of countering uh, those uh, allegations. Uh, the presidential election petition, as you know, must be determined within uh, 14 days. And uh, scrutiny of all that electronic evidence and all manner of evidence has to be done within a very, very specified um, and short period of time. Now, there were wild allegations apart from the one of infiltration of the service. There were also other electronic uh, or other uh, um, electronic attacks that were made uh, to the judges. Uh, we saw the social media, um, you know, make very wild allegations against uh, judges drawing caricatures uh, and uh, you know cartoons and making all manner of allegations, Twitter attacks uh, on judges, allegations of bribery, creating of fake Twitter accounts. For one particular judge, there were up to nine fake Twitter accounts that were created and that were uh, being used by people outside uh, there to uh, create all manner of uh, uh, um, uh, fake uh, stories and, uh, you know, paint judges in very, very negative ways. And uh, what the judiciary did is uh, to, uh, to get someone here to uh, counter that 
mm. fake information, fake news, by getting in touch with the, 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 the news media and say this is fake news. In fact, in one particular instance, there was a, a fake frontline uh, headline created by one of the fake newspapers to say that just so and so has received millions of dollars, mm. which is going to be used to influence the other judges, which was totally uh, 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 false, not true at all. So all those barrage of attacks against judges are very, very discouraging. Um, but uh, by and large, I would say that uh, um, the, the, the judges were able to uh, still do a very, very commendable job in mm -hmm. spite of uh, all those attacks. So I would like to conclude by saying the main challenge is the spin or rather the, 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 the misinformation that is deliberately created by uh, some of the parties to the entire electoral system. Thank you. Great, thank you. You know, I think that uh, it'll be, when we get to Ronan um, later in the discussion, um, this idea of how technology and the what you mentioned in regards to the lack of understanding of the technology can be used in a way to, to erode trust. And then I do think this, this issue of uh, judges being under attack in social media the, in other ways only brings more focus to the fact that people understand that, that elections are becoming more and more uh, litigated, that judges are playing a bigger role. And so even before an election, uh, people are trying to position a, um, themselves to be able to erode trust in the judiciary as part of the electoral process, which I think is something that's very frightening and, and rather new. And I think I'll turn now to Judge Thunheim. You know, Judge, what's your, you know, you've worked, uh, you know, around the world, uh, not just in the United States, um, but most recently you're seeing these attacks and, and some of these issues that you've seen internationally coming to the United States. Um, what's your experience with how the role technology is playing in elections and how courts in the U.S. are dealing with these vulnerabilities and these questions? Well, thank you, Chad, and I'm glad to be here uh, today with everybody. Uh, you know, in the United States, it's very interesting right now. I think that the problems largely are political problems rather than technology problems you know, caused really by the political environment in the United States, which is highly charged and partisan right now. And secondly, overt political attacks on election results in ways that were not done in the past, despite having no evidence uh, that mm -hmm. elections have been rigged. And then the third is largely a, a sort of a lack of understanding and fear of technology. I mean, we hear daily someone has hacked into some account. Uh, corporations are dealing with this all the time. The federal judiciary has dealt with it as well, uh, hacking into systems. And so people are, are vulnerable to charges that someone is behind uh, changing the results in election machines, the electoral uh, technology. And I think there's really no uh, evidence of that happening. I wanted to mention, uh, because it's been in the news, uh, the recent settlement that Fox News mm. uh, uh, entered into with one of the primary uh, manufacturers of, uh, of voting machines, uh, Dominion. Uh, and that's a huge, it was a huge settlement, uh, $800 million. Uh, the charge in the case was that the company, or that the Fox News had alleged uh, that the company was lying about uh, election fraud and rigging the 2020 election in favor of uh, Joe Biden. Uh, there's another lawsuit that's equally difficult for Fox News. It's still pending by Smartmatic. And I think there's also a, a case that's very interesting in Georgia where election workers have sued uh, um, Trump advisors and lawyers mm -hmm. representing Trump uh, because of the claims of falsely tampering with results. All of this, I think, undermines the uh, confidence that people have in electoral technology. And that's, that's a problem. It's a trust issue more than anything else because I still cannot find any real evidence anywhere that 
anyone has been able to rig uh, voting machines. And uh, certainly the newest technology, the scanning technology, which is used uh, in most uh, mm -hmm. jurisdictions now in the United States is safe and there's a paper backup. So, um, you know, it, it, the, it's a trust, it's an image problem more than it is a real problem, Chad, in the United States. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, this this issue of um, technology creating this vulnerability to manipulation, I think, is really interesting. Even if the technology itself isn't the problem, um, but it's clearly being taken advantage of. And and I, you know, I and how we, I, I wonder um, what these cases, the Dominion cases, others, if it's going to change behavior in this next cycle or not. I would I would hope so. Um, but it also indicates that that case in particular, I think, shows how many times I think people working on elections think that the social media problem is not something that can be addressed. But I think those defamation cases that aren't a social media um, cases specifically, but I think uh, the, the narrative of fraud and all of the other issues that came up, there is some litigation trying to address it, which I think is going to be interesting over time. Um, do you? Do you think that there's going to be, uh, do you think it's going to change behavior or not? I mean, it might with some of the large broadcasters, but I think it's still going to, social media is still going to be able to um, make these claims, I, I imagine. I think the claims are going to continue. Uh, you know, uh, uh, large media outlets who are fighting for viewers, I mean, I think that was the whole issue here that Fox was worried about losing uh, right-wing voters to other new news media outlets. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were repeating what they were hearing Trump and his advisors saying, and it's cost them dearly. And mm -hmm. the, there will be a, a significant settlement, I think, in the other case as well. Uh, and these news companies don't want the internal discussions that they've had uh, broadcast widely. So that's why settlements are in order. Yep, yeah, yeah, great. It's going to be interesting to see how that over time, and I'm not sure how this is playing out internationally. Um, uh, Justice Yagata Nimpar, um, how's your experience in Nigeria? You've recently gone through an election process, um, and you know there's been uh, technologies been introduced to the legal framework, and there's been other uh, uh, vote disinformation of social media issues. How's your experience in Nigeria um, with technology and elections and the role the judiciary is playing? I'm not sure if you're if you're muted. We can't hear you. Sorry, I was thrown out <laughs> earlier. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for the first time in Nigeria, I think um, this Taking the nudge a little bit higher by introducing the accredited, accredit I come out quite uh, good as we thought through it. It's actually low because of the outcome. In one place, it will work. In another place, it might not work. But one can also justify that with the fact that uh, the, the internet is not very strong in the entire country. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you, you have people, the expectation was quite high, but I think the outcome did not justify that expectation. So there's some little distrust in the process. The suspicion of manipulation, whether it will be justified or not, we are waiting for the tribunals to come out with their findings. But if it is the general outlook, definitely the introduction probably needs to be rejected by education, basically, and training. The electoral umpire has to train its own staff because there were allegations of instead of transmitting results, you see the, the, the officers transmitting their own pictures. So at the end of the the, the, the results were not transmitted. It is the pictures of the 
election officials that were transmitted. And you are expected to like um, keep a manual copy of the results hmm. while you transmit it in order to reinforce the integrity of what was done at the polling unit. But with all the speculations and the allegations going backward and forward, well, we're waiting to see how the courts will come out uh, with that. But definitely, I, I want to believe that the introduction of technology is a positive development because it, it shortens the process of elections. The accreditation is done within the shortest possible time. And if results can be transmitted also in the same dimension, then I think we'll go further and it will help in reinforcing the integrity of uh, elections in Nigeria, having come from the traditional methods that were manipulated or subject to manipulation or human error. Mm -hmm. We are we're going somewhere. I, I think we need to move it forward. In spite of the allegations, we should not discard it. We should move it forward. Great, thank you. Um, I think you, that was a perfect, uh lead into uh, some questions for Rona and our technology experts. So thank you for that. Um, and I think Nigeria has had such a, a, a spotlight put on it over the years and the, the how large that process is. It's, it's really uh, something to, to behold and the changes that have taken place. But Ronan, um, you know, you've worked on this issue globally uh, for the EU, for the UN, for IFAS, for, for, for many, many institutions. institutions. I think, uh, what Justice Nepar just said was, technology, we're not gonna stop using technology. Um, and so we do have to think about how, how we live with it, how we use it properly. Um, and so as you're looking at this issue with technology and judges having to make decisions about um, the accuracy of, of results and voter registry systems and all of the issues they're having to deal with, um, do you think there are ways that, that we as practitioners and academics could call for um, ways to implement technology that would actually bring more transparency, that could make the job easier for judges with proper evidence, uh, considering everything that they have to deal with. What's your experience with this issue of technology elections and how it's adjudicated uh, at this point in time? And, and if you see that there's, if it's going in the right direction, the wrong direction. It's a lot in there, but um, uh, very eager to hear your perception on this. Thank you, Chad, and uh, hello, everybody. It's a privilege to be uh, on this panel with the distinguished jurists. Um, like you, Chad, I, I share a sense of slight um, guilt over, as practitioners, how for many, many decades and years we've got on with implementing technology and not really had uh, given enough thought, shall we say, particularly as technologists, to uh, how it might play out uh, in an electoral dispute resolution context. So the last number of years, let's say the last decade, the, the emphasis has shifted and elections management bodies are increasingly, as you said in, in the introduction, elections are being litigated. And therefore, uh, the, and, and, and the increased use of technology mean that the technology is often uh, central to, to the electoral dispute resolution and, and, and the, the litigation that follows. Um, trust and so on, uh, it's almost a cliche, but trust and transparency go hand in hand, um, but it, it bears repetition. And so rather than just simply repeat it, I, I, I will go further. I mean, transparency is no longer negotiable. Uh, transparency mm -hmm. isn't uh, an optional extra or some uh, something any MBE can choose uh, to be transparent or not to be transparent. It is, it's an inherent part of um, creating the environment in which um, trust is built and, or, and sustained. Uh, as you alluded to, it's never the technology. It's the institution implementing the technology. It's the context, political and, and environmental, in which the technology is being deployed that makes the difference. You will not replace the absence of trust uh, in an institution by the introduction of technology. Mm. It just doesn't work that way. And uh, a trusted institution uh, might get away with a, a less than perfect implementation of technology but um, a, a, a t an institution that does not enjoy trust will struggle uh, um, to, to increase 
uh, trust or will struggle to implement technology because the distrust in the institution there's contagion so any technology introduced by an untrusted institution will not enjoy any inherent trust regardless of that technology's inherent trustworthiness shall we say um so and one final point as well on on on, on um, transparency transparency isn't a switch you can throw on or off you you, you can't just <laughs> arrive in the middle of a a well a well argued electoral petition and say oh well now we'll be transparent um, as we'll do, I'll discuss later, uh, in, the it's a slow uh, um, building brick by brick of a wall of of uh, trust uh, and electoral integrity. So that means that um, the institution itself has to be uh, engaged in consultation with all stakeholders from the very moment a decision is made about uh, a, a technology, whether it be results management systems, whether it be electronic voting systems, whether it be biometrics at the voter registration or voter authentication uh, space, that, 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 that they're the three kind of main uh, areas where it's used. And engagement with, like meaningful engagement with stakeholders, even the ones you don't like, the, the ones you perceive as adversarial for an elections management body that's critical and then substantive actual technical substantive engagement on the technologies being procured how they're being procured how they're being implemented this all has to happen months and months and months yeah. and possibly years prior to the electoral event in question if that's done two two benefits accrue from that the stakeholders with whom you engage in a comprehensive way, including judiciaries, and we're seeing uh, cautious but careful collaborations between elections management bodies and uh, stakeholders, including judiciaries, to ensure everybody understands the technology that's being deployed. So the benefit is that the first benefit is that the stakeholders who are going to end up in, in an EDR context, um, uh, arguing or defending and so on, and, and, and adjudicating obviously, are informed so that everyone's up at a level of um, knowledge. Uh, so that's good. It means that these high time bound EDR uh, uh, cases can in fact uh, su successfully move forward. That's the first thing. The second benefit and um, is the, the, the vacuum of the vacuum created or mm -hmm. existing where there's a lack of transparency in the EMB, that vacuum will fill up rapidly with misinformation. So it's vital that the EMB have its voice uh, in, a, in calm, detailed, comprehensive uh, information sharing from the very get-go. And that will never stop the, 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 those evil uh, persons who will seek to um, uh, cast about misinformation, but certainly if the EMB is not in the lead being comprehensively transparent about technology from the very get-go and throughout the process, then uh, the trust is very, very difficult to build and, and to sustain. Um, I think that's, uh, I mean, the obvious example, well, the, the most vivid example in, in, in the last number of uh, months uh, is the extreme reaction of the elections management body in Brazil, uh, mm. who, who sanctioned in a very significant way former President Bolsonaro. I think his the primary reason for his being declared ineligible for, uh, I think, another eight years to run for political office uh, is because of his consistent and un, unsupported attack on the, the technology, uh, his attempt to, to, to undermine trust in, in those systems. And so that's a very vivid uh, recent example. Um, but I think the key takeaway, transparency isn't a switch that you can just turn on or off. You need to invest from, from the get-go over a prolonged period of time in building uh, the trust and building your uh, through, through your uh, solid effort on transparency over the long term. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think we've seen from um in, in the philippines for example where technology was procured and implemented very quickly with the assumption that it was going to create all of this trust um and i think we've learned so much since then how much time is required how much education is required the technology is really a small part of the overall picture not the entire picture and i i hope we're starting to see that um but one thing that you've hit on is is transparency and i you know i've almost I've almost gotten to be, we use that term so much that it almost becomes something uh, that can be interpreted by many people in many ways. Um, I think 
in in a legal system, yeah, you know, there's the, the the regulations that oversee the elections and the and the process that the judiciary is using. Um, and then there's the evidence that judges have to uh, use to make their decisions and the arguments that have been presented. Um, and I do think this makes the definition of transparency even more important in this in this situation that we need transparency into the technology and the information, the data that's in the system for judges to make decisions. Um, but there's a tension, right, between there's data privacy issues. I, I'm getting a little bit off topic, but this will get back to our questions. But I wanted to ask you, Ronan, in your experience, the EMBs are very reluctant many times to, to provide this transparency because they don't understand what their role might be in protecting this data or how the data might be used um, or the way to be frank, observers might use the data in a way, or, or candidates might use the data. You know, do you think, and, and this is, I'm gonna ask you a one follow-up question, Ronan, then I'm gonna to turn to Judge Thunheim on this question, but this idea of transparency and providing evidence to the judiciary, um, what kind of tensions do you see between data protection and, and, and transparency and, and what EMBs are being asked to do and this idea of really being as transparent as possible? Uh, good question. Uh, I mean, and data protection is a simple term, but it covers a yeah. multitude yeah. of very different things. So if we mean, there's two things that are absolutely worthy of protecting, the, the personal information of a voter, and particularly mm -hmm. their biometrics, uh, and in some cases, whether or not they have voted and so on. So that's, part, that, that's data that needs to be protected. Um, and obviously, obviously, but the, their choice in the it, it, where, where where voting is taking place, whether on paper or electronically or some combination of the two, the protection of the voter's choice is is, is a fundamental, a foundational mm -hmm. principle. So those things have to be protected. But um, the protection of those two things, so uh, voters' registers, uh, biometrics, and the choice of the voter, and so on. The, the, the need to protect those on the one hand contrasts sharply with uh, the need to be uh, absolutely open and transparent mm -hmm. when it comes to, for example, election results, which are often treated as state secrets by EMBs and so on. <laughs> um, so, and I would add one technical point, that is the protection, and I think an excellent example, and this is, is the Kenya 2022, where the elections management body in its in its in the disclosure of, of, of evidence in response to the court uh, discovery order uh, said mm -hmm. we're we're not prepared to give the plaintiffs uh, highly mm -hmm. sensitive information in terms of um, our servers because that would expose our staff uh, so that, that those who are working on elections. However, uh, even as they said they weren't going to give it to the plaintiff, they did provide that information to the court. So I think that's an important uh, point to make. But the, there's, there's information that is rightly protected and shouldn't be exposed or, or, or compromised. But there's a huge amount of uh, election data, and including the polling scheme, including some statistics about participation, and in particular election results, which are inherently, uh, um, you, cannot, you cannot say we will not share those and citing data protection. So I, I just mentioned those two aspects. No, perfect. Um, thank you for that. And I, uh, this is kind of get, leads me to my uh, question that I have for Judge Thunheim is, um, can uh, legal frameworks, I, I, think, I think election management bodies and the judiciary try to err on the side of caution many times. So if they can not release the data and get away with it, they're going to because it's, it's less risky. Um, so could regulations and the legal framework help EMBs decide this distinction between what should be protected and what should not be protected? And are you seeing in the, the because of the United States, um, all of the different frameworks to, to regulate elections in each state, but you know, you're dealing mostly with federal questions, so it shouldn't be as, as distinct, but are you seeing legal frameworks among states trying to deal with this technology issue? I know there's a call for paper trails, which we've all discussed and think is pro proper, um, but do you think the legal frameworks are dealing with technology? Can they be used to help with this litigation process? Should there be an eye towards what happens when it comes to litigation um, in the legal framework and how, how this is all contextualized within the political environment you described? 
Well, I, I think that the, the framework doesn't really lend itself to litigation. I mean, the mm. framework uh, and frameworks are different. Every state is a little bit different, although there's been more consistency in the past 15 years or so than we've ever had in the past. But our constitution requires that states control elections, even federal elections within their boundaries, which makes for a bit of a patchwork for how uh, elections are guided by a legal framework. And, you know, federal judges get involved in uh, matters that are typically state related matters. There might be a federal constitutional question, which is typically what's raised in cases like this. And I think judges have, uh, have felt free to order uh, all kinds of information provided to them. Now they can protect some of that information by sealing it from the public, but at the same time, judges have found that they have pretty clear access to anything that they want. Um, the, the ability to have a paper trail coming from an election voting machine is really, really important. And I think that, that helps with the matter of trust as well. Uh, people don't trust what goes on inside a machine. People don't trust software. They have enough problems with their own computers to know that uh, computers can fail and people can manipulate computers. But the paper trail is, is really important. It's really important for judges as well. And I think about 80% uh, of elections in the United States now use the uh, scanned ballots mm -hmm. where you fill out a ballot uh, with a black uh, felt pen and it is scanned by the machine and counted either at the precinct or it is counted at a central location. And so you do have a paper trail for when there are election disputes related to uh, questions. But our election disputes really in the last uh, uh, big election cycle were election disputes that had a dearth of evidence. I mean, plaintiffs were coming forward with wild claims, but they had no evidence to support it. Uh, and I think judges properly handled those cases rather quickly. If you have evidence to support fraud, then bring it to the court. The court will deal with it quickly and, uh, and precisely. But uh, many of these challenges didn't have really any evidence backing them up. But we, we, we have a problem with states having different ways of managing their systems. Uh, the federal law, the Help America Vote Act, uh, some years back has helped a lot. It provided guidelines for states, and I think, uh, I think nearly uh, two-thirds of states are using many of those guidelines now to make sure that elections are run fairly. But we still have gaps, and those gaps are going to lead to cases, they're going to lead to concerns. And, uh, and I think that the sooner we make elections much more consistent across the country, mm -hmm. the, the quicker we're going to be able to rebut claims that are demonstrably false, but people believe them. And uh, social media makes that even worse. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, um, you know, looking at those more consistency would be of huge value. I think one question, just very quickly, Judge Schoenheim, to follow up on uh, something you mentioned, um, and this could be a whole nother discussion, is one thing that I think has been unique in the United States now is many of those claims that were filed in the United States that had no evidence backing them up. Some of the lawyers under Rule 11 uh, have started to find themselves being uh, sanctioned or even, you know, uh, there, there seems to be some accountability for filing these frivolous lawsuits. This is internationally, we don't see that very often. I think there's a lot of restrict, a lot of thought that we shouldn't be sanctioning lawyers for bringing these uh, frivolous cases. What are your thoughts and what you're seeing in the United States um, with many of these uh, lawyers bringing these cases without any evidence, but just based on on pure hearsay? Well, I think the inquiries into their conduct in bringing uh, claims without any uh, factual basis whatsoever, which is a violation of the rules in virtually every state and certainly in, in the, the federal rules of procedure as well, I think that's, a, that's an important step. Um, these cases got a lot of attention, public 
paid a lot of attention to them. You know, Fox News broadcasts them every day about all these claims that uh, the election was rigged. And if you have evidence, great. But if you don't have evidence, don't drag the courts in uh, and create a headline just for the sake of undermining elections. So I think the, the fact that many of these lawyers are subject to disciplinary actions now, most notably Rudy Giuliani, who is a very famous name and someone who uh, people tend to follow. I mean, I think that's a good development because lawyers need to have facts behind them before they bring a lawsuit. Right, yes. And I, I do wonder if um, in many countries we could start to look at this as an option uh, for some of these issues. Um, Justice uh, Nimpar, and we're looking at, at, at uh, Nigeria. I know there have been um, a lot of amendments and changes to the election law. Um, you know, how do you think that that's impacting your process? Did the changes in election law regarding technology and other issues, does that make the, uh, you know, in the United States, it's very, it's very hard to change election law and, and, and especially federal ones. Uh, but I know in many states, it's much easier to change um, the legal framework and, and to amend the election law. Um, what's your experience in Nigeria uh, with how amendments in the election law are impacting the way that, that, that elections are administered and, and the way that they're adjudicated? If you might be muted, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I'm not sure she's still in the call. Oh, did she get dropped, maybe? Probably. Okay. Well, I'll turn to Justice uh, Musinga then. Um, and, you know, of, of everything you've been, been hearing about, uh, you've had to deal with uh, changes in, um, the Electoral Act following the 2017 election in Kenya. Um, how do you think those processes and rules of procedure have actually impacted the way that, that you all have been uh, working with uh, judicial complaints and the electoral process in Kenya? All right, thank you. I think as you know, uh, it was only in 2017 when uh, the Supreme Court I validated the presidential election and uh, there were some changes to the, uh, to the, uh, <clears throat> to the law and the rules that uh, regulate uh, the presidential election that were made uh, particularly regarding electronic filing. Now we have a system that uh, allows both electronic and uh, uh, electronic filing and service as well as uh, uh, physical uh, filing and, and, and service. Um, I had said earlier that uh, the constitution gives the Supreme Court 14 days uh, within which they are to hear and make an initial determination. There before the laws did not stipulate what has to take place within their period of 14 days. Now, the, 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 there were amendments that were made in the year 2020, and there were several. Uh, I mean, just need to highlight them very quickly. I have said that uh, after the 14 days, the Supreme Court has 21 days within which it has to deliver a reasoned uh, judgment. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, um, the rules provide that uh, the petition has to be filed within seven days of the declaration of the results. Secondly, the petition has to be served electronically within six hours of filing. And if you're going to do it physically, you must do so within 24 hours. Then the electoral body is provide, uh, um, um, the electoral body provides the court with all the electoral declaration materials within 48 hours of being served with the petition. Uh, a response has to be filed within four days of service. Then a rejoinder has to be made within 
uh, 24 hours. And all these processes can be done both physically and electronically. Uh, then the pretrial conference has to take place within eight days. And that includes rendering a determination on all the interlocutory applications. And during the 2022 presidential election uh, petition, uh, the, the scrutiny of electoral bodies, servers, and scrutiny of uh, ballot boxes uh, in select polling stations was carried out uh, and the report was prepared within 48 hours. Then the rules now state that on the ninth day, the hearing itself has to begin and that takes two to three days. Then the court retires to consider evidence and deliver uh, the, 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 the short ruling within, uh, you know, within 14 days. And then as I said, um, make a determination um, within 24 days or rather within 21 days give the reasoned uh, decision. Um, so one of the changes as I indicated was to exp expressly provide that some of these processes can be done electronically, uh, if it is those short, uh, you know, interlocutory matters and so on, the service. So we have now the complementary system uh, of uh, doing things electronically and, um, and uh, 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 physical uh, hearing and, and, and service. I think those are the only changes that I can think of that were made uh, prior to the 2020 uh, election, uh, 2022 elections. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, a, a quick follow-up question um, yes. for you. And we've talked about, uh, for example, the in Brazil, how there was this remedy that the candidate can't run for office for eight years um, because of them basically not being honest in the in the process and trying to undermine election results is so something that we're always looking at is do you believe that you have the remedies the sanctions in your power to change the behavior of candidates that misbehave does your legal framework allow you um give you the tools you need to sanction parties, to sanction candidates or others in a way that will, will change their behavior in the future? Or do you think your legal framework restricts your ability to do that? Yes, our legal framework enables an election court to bar a candidate for a given period of time, depending on the nature of infraction or an election offense that is committed. For example, if it is proved that a candidate um, uh, was administering an illegal oath to voters to cause them to vote for him, the election, the election court has the power to bar that candidate for, say, even five years in the next cycle of elections. And that has happened. In, mm. Yes, it has happened. Great. Thank you. I think I'm going to um, turn to Judge Thunheim before uh, turning back to uh, Ronan very quickly on that point. You know, we're always looking at these remedies um of course trying to determine the results of an election is 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 the time bound issue that we're always dealing with but the way to change behavior and the remedies that are available this idea of banning candidates from being able to run for elections is a is a pretty extreme um uh, remedy but i think it probably is very effective in some ways uh, what are your thoughts, Judge Thunheim, and, and the remedies that are available to courts and what's effective? And do we have a good idea of what's effective to change behavior? That's a really good question, Chad. And I don't know that we have really good remedies. We can, uh, you know, political parties can be fined by courts. Candidates can be fined. I think most state election boards have very little power to sanction other than mm -hmm. to is relatively minimal fines for infractions that they see. Courts definitely have more power, but I don't see much power uh, in the way of banning candidates from running in the future. I think that might run afoul of our First Amendment. Uh, it's, it's definitely a very good sanction, I think, to stop uh, really extreme behavior. 
but uh, even being convicted of a crime uh, would not stop someone from uh, running for president, even a crime related to election fraud uh, in the United States. So we don't have that extreme sanction, but we do have the ability to sanction lawyers uh, who bring these cases. We have the ability to sanction parties who are uh, either convicted of criminal activity or uh, you know, uh, convicted of election violations. And sometimes sanctions like that can have an impact. It certainly has an impact on the public seeing uh, how courts are treating uh, political actors. But at the same time, that ultimate sanction that's being imposed in Brazil, I don't see that ability. Uh, perhaps states have some power in that respect, but I've never seen it. They certainly don't have that power here in the state of Minnesota. Right. No, I think it's a it's very interesting time to look at these remedies that might be available as um, the environment's changing so much. I think it's an interesting question. Um, something that's been raised in the chat, and I want to uh, bring this to Ronan um, very quickly, is this idea of forensic investigations, of, of being able to actually, if a court is, if there is a, a, a legitimate um, claim that there's been some sort of problem uh, with the results transmission system or some other technology. Um, do you think uh, in your experience that the institutions we're working with, the EMBs and the, the courts themselves have the ability to do these forensic investigations of the timelines they have? And is this an issue that you're running into? Is it something you're seeing? Um, you know, and do you have any recommendations of, of how in the international setting we could start to look at this issue of investigating technology in the electoral process? Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent question um, regarding computer forensics. Uh, again, a, a, a short phrase, but it, it, can, it covers a multitude yeah. of possible <laughs> targets and sources, and um, you can imagine the, the number of devices uh, in in the case for example of um field deployed technology where you have a device in every polling station and those devices might be identical uh, uh, as is the case in many countries or they might so that's a homogenous um uh, subject object for investigation cyber cyber forensics computer forensics uh, or they might be um a completely uh um random meaning for example in the case of um the polling station level results management system uh, in in pakistan in 2018 uh, the device in question used at the polling station was the presiding officer's own smartphone so mm -hmm. then you could have a hundred thousand different device types and so on the point the point i'm making is is the complexity as well as the scale um of any such uh, uh, forensics when in the context of the very very tight timelines that um um that justin Musinga spoke about earlier in kenya days 96 hours you yeah. know three four five days and so on um so that's the first thing now the the, the, the one other response to it is to suggest that that the desire to do a computer forensic uh audit um may 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 be perceived or um as a fishing expedition so that if we if we get enough access to systems we may be able to find something and so on so it goes back to the probable cause that manuel's question uh, asks um i think there's another element here and i would say this that in terms of and we saw this shift from and it's described in the paper in our paper the the, the fs paper uh, from 2017 to, 20, to 22 uh the the, the the shift in readiness and preparedness of the emb uh, to anticipate the disclosure, the discovery request, and therefore rapidly respond and very comprehensively respond. That, that's something, and it goes back to the transparency discussion earlier, when you're deciding to introduce a technology now in, in, the, in the 2020s, um, you must design in from the very get-go transparency, but also um, ease of extraction of evidence, of e-discovery, e e-disclosure. So I think um, institutionally and in terms of our support to and, and increasingly it's being done by technology vendors, but that the requirements uh, for the procurement and therefore the, the solutions procured and implemented must be already uh, engineered in a way that makes um, the forensic, the task of forensics uh, easier and quicker. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, I think this is obviously something that um, institutions like IFAS, the EU, the UNDP, others, I think we need to start to think about um, for the judiciary, what's the EMB doing to prepare for these requests and be able to provide this evidence in a timely fashion? I don't think it's, um, it also gets back to what we talked about earlier. And I, I know you don't like these large phrases, that I, which I completely agree, but data privacy, for example, you know, the EMBs have to be mindful of that. There's so many uh, questions here um, that I think we need to be seeing the lit litigation process as part of the electoral process. Um, and I think we need to, I know IFAS, we need to continue to, to work on that. Um, Justice Masinga, I have a question for you in regards to Kenya. I mean, going from the, the 2017 um, Supreme Court, you know, canceled the presidential elections to, you know, the elections that happened in 2022. And, and Ronan um, mentioned how the preparation was, was different between the two. Um, what was your personal experience, you know, in this process of, of becoming prepared for what was likely to come your way in 2022 and, and how those, in your view, how those two elections uh, were different or how the, the process was different? What was your personal experience in those two very distinct elections? Uh, thank you. I think there were some differences uh, in towards a preparation. Um, I had already mentioned um, the amendments of our laws. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, the level of training and preparation. Um, you know, the 2017 general election was the first time that uh, Kenya conducted uh, elections in accordance with uh, the complex system um, that required um, the use of technology, including the amendments to the Elections Act um, made uh, to identify or, or rather to introduce the Kenya Integrated Electoral Management, Management System uh, which is a new device was uh, intended to be used for biometric uh, voter registration and voter identification and the simultaneous transmission of election results from the polling stations. Um, and despite assurances by IABC, that is the electoral management body, is that it did analyze and anticipated each and every scenario uh, that could uh, pop up uh, the situation was found to be different. And so one of the things that um, we had to do as a Judiciary Committee on Elections is to work very closely with uh, the electoral management body uh, to train judges and uh, expose them to the technology that was going to be used. We had to, to do a lot of simulations of how the voting you know, you know, takes place, the, how the voter is identified electronically and uh, um, uh, the cooperation between the electoral body and judges and magistrates and our, our researchers and all uh, persons who are going to, 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 to play any part in the electoral process uh, was very, very important. Uh, we had uh, to introduce uh, regulations to show uh, how um, electronic scrutiny uh, of all these electron, ele electron materials is going to be done, uh, who was going to be responsible for preparing reports, what are the checklists that is, has to be prepared uh, for ensuring that there is a properly conducted uh, scrutiny uh, of all these electron materials. And uh, we brought together uh, art lawyers we brought a political parties representatives so that all the major players uh, were in the picture about the technology and, uh, uh, and, and how it was going to work. And we crafted regulations that would guide the entire process. Um, so going out in the countryside and showing uh, the, the general populace, the, 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 the kits, the, the Kim's mm -hmm. kits, the gadgets that would be uh, used, you know, uh, was very, very useful and uh, showing them uh, the, the, the regulations that were going to be employed uh, engendered public confidence in, uh, in, 
that system. And so I think that was very, very important. It is one thing that I think made the 2022 election a, a bit different, or quite different in a significant manner from the way they were conducted in 2017. Great, thank you. I think um, many lessons to learn from Kenya in that timeline. And I think panels like this allow us to see those very practical steps that were taken and then preparation for 2022. And I think it's something that other judiciaries and EMBs need to be thinking about and we need to make sure we understand them. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Judge Thunheim uh, some very specific legal questions because we've got our, our colleague Manuel Wally with um, a couple of questions in here in which we're always discussing. Um, so I'm kind of excited about this discussion, but this is very, very, very much for the lawyers in the audience. So um, I will ask these two questions first about how probable cause is, is used to um, decide when a case should go forward or not. Um, the other the other question would be this um, the shifting of burden of proof when 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 does the state have to start to produce evidence and defend itself if, after a plaintiff brings a case I think these are very US kind of common law questions um, civil law handles that very differently but I think so I, I've just I'm giving Judge Tunheim a little leeway on those two questions because they weren't prepared. Um, and then after after Judge Tunheim, what I'd like all the panelists to to think about is, you know, this is a unique situation where we have political scientists, practitioners uh, as our audience. Um, I do, I often see there's this, the lawyers of the judiciary talk to one another and bar associations and, and uh, in the publications of law schools and others provide, but there isn't often a lot of uh, discussion between political scientists and the judiciary and lawyers. And I, my question to this group would be, are there ways that some of the, the, the work of political scientists could, could help us in understanding the challenges we're facing and, and ways in which the two, the legal community and the academic community, the PhD, the political scientists in particular, and economists could start to work together. So I'm gonna just phrase that first, but first to Judge Thunheim, these questions of, of probable cause. Um, I do think that in many places where uh, frivolous lawsuits are filed, I'm not sure if every place we work in the world has this idea of probable cause, it would be something, a threshold that the plaintiff has to get over to start litigation. So what are your thoughts on that? And then secondly, um, this idea of when does the plaintiff, when does the burden shift to the state to produce evidence to start to defend itself after plaintiff brings a case? I think this is something in many countries that we work in that the plaintiff is always responsible to collecting all the evidence and presenting the evidence, but much of the evidence is held by the state, so they can't get access to it. So a couple of questions I think the US deals with that I don't know if the rest of the world deals with the same. So turn it over to you. Well, thank you. They're very interesting questions. And, uh, you know, in some respects aren't explored that deeply in the United States, just because we haven't had the kind of really, really serious uh, uh, claims that that address these issues. Probable cause, of course, is a is a, a criminal uh, justice term that we consider whether to bring charges against someone, whether there's probable cause that a crime has been committed. But you know, it, it's actually similar in civil litigation as well. If there's a challenge to an election result or a challenge to how uh, uh, elections were conducted, um, generally the standard that we apply is that uh, the the complaint that is filed by the lawyer, uh, if it uh, if it alleges violations of the law, uh, you're going to look at it carefully because it's they really only have to make the allegation at the beginning. But it's more than that. You can't just say this election was fraudulent, therefore it should be overturned. You have mm -hmm. to show some level of, of evidence uh, proving that uh, there is something wrong that needs to be further explored. Um, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we think of complaints as, as really stating uh, the, the, uh, the, the facts which will allow a case to go forward. You have to state facts that are legitimate facts that are backed up by some level of evidence. You don't have to prove your case to bring a case. And uh, that's where, where some people uh, get confused. So it's
it's up to the judge to decide, uh, is there enough here to go forward? And sometimes that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. you, you, the state uh, plays a role there because the state files an answer or typically will file a motion to dismiss saying there's no evidence that this happened. And then sometimes it's a, it's a difficult decision for a judge at that point in time to decide whether the case should go forward. It is similar to a probable cause determination in the criminal case. It's a level of evidence that you have to get past in order to keep the case going, but it's not the evidence that you need to prove your case eventually. Mm -hmm. Uh, so not, uh, not a real easy concept to, to uh, explain, but uh, judges uh, do that in most every case that, that is brought before them. They determine whether there's enough to go forward. And on burden shifting, you know, I think that the way I look at that is uh, it's more a burden of production. The burden of proof mm -hmm. is going to always remain on the plaintiff, uh, mm -hmm. the person bringing the case. You have to show by a preponderance of evidence that there is uh, this uh, legal problem that needs to be uh, redressed. Uh, but there is, at, at some point in time, if the plaintiff has shown enough to show that there is something that needs to be much more uh, examined, much more further in depth, then the, there is a burden of production that will shift to the state to produce evidence to demonstrate that uh, the election was conducted properly. Uh, so uh, again, it's uh, a lot of that is in the hands of the judge and uh, the trial court judge who has a case like this has a lot of power. Much of this is unreviewable by a court of appeals, maybe eventually, uh, but the trial court judge does have a lot of power to make these initial determinations as to when a case should go forward, when the state has to respond. We're not going to require the state to respond to a frivolous lawsuit. Mm -hmm. that, that will just encourage more frivolous lawsuits and will be overwhelmed. So you have to make a determination that there is something there that requires much more in-depth examination to see whether there's a problem. Great, thank you. No, I think this is something that we have to explore in more detail internationally as judges are dealing with more frivolous lawsuits or, or strategic litigation to try to erode trust in the process and try to think through how to, and I think these two, these, the arrow, these two arrows, their quiver are something the judges have, both the probable cause determination or, or to determine if a case should go forward and also this burden of production on the state, which I think is something that can be a roadblock to litigation. Um, so definitely something to, just, to look into further. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to turn to Ronan next with my question that I had previously. You know, you've looked at, you've worked in all of these fields, being a technologist, and you've worked with uh, uh, academics, you've worked with practitioners, you've worked on EDR. Um, you know, where do you think that that there should be some more linkages between the judiciary, the legal community, and some of the work that academics and practitioners are doing? Um, do you still think there's a void or, or am I actually asking a question we don't need to ask? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on this as we're uh, part of this academic conference? I wanted to make sure we ask this question. Um, no, there is a void and it's in one sense, it's understandable because technology moves forward at a rapid pace and technological innovation presents challenges to regulators and, and um, legal systems in every country. Um, um, just look at, the, look at the, the litigation surrounding, for example, um, uh, cryptocurrencies and so on, incredibly mm. difficult. Um, I think that, uh, and I, I made a note earlier, the, we talked about designing technology so that it's kind of EDR ready. Um, and we also spoke about the need and others and, and the, the work that was done in Kenya, I think, in preparation for 2022 was was a, a fine example. Um, and uh, Tiffany has alluded to it in the comments as well in the chat. Um, training people, sharing information, you can call it training, you can call it information sharing, you can call it outreach and so on. And I made a note that um, for me, uh, I think I responded, broadening that to include all stakeholders. Um, so there's a huge amount of work required to ensure that everybody uh, understands what it is is going on with this piece of technology or that piece of technology and so forth, because the the, the time the time needed to conduct um, uh, 
these petitions is so short. Um, mm. I think technology vendors have a role to play uh, in making their systems um, uh, better documented and easier to understand. The, the debate over open source, closed source is, is in, in a sense, that's mm. a technical uh, debate, but certainly there are examples in the world, uh, the Kenya, via, um, excuse me, the California, state of California a voting system for everyone, that project where the, in its entirety, this, the source code is, is open source. Uh, there are arguments either way. I could hand you the source code to any number of uh, systems used in, in elections, do, but do you have the capacity to, mm -hmm. uh, to interpret that and to conduct? So there's a role for academia, that's clear. Um, and sometimes these roles are collaborative, sometimes they're antagonistic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we look at the um, the ongoing spat between um, uh, in the state of Georgia in the US um, uh, and uh, those um, those in the in the academic and technical world who who are out there pointing out that there are still vulnerabilities in the systems, much to the annoyance of um, uh, the the election of officials in that state and so on. Um, that's an unfortunate spat, and, and, and I think it's worth pointing out that the language being used by the Secretary of State's office is, uh, I'm just going to cite it here, um, it, it, the paranoics and the conspiracists of the world have their beliefs reinforced when they read reports of theoretical vulnerabilities that fail yes. to mention the real world security measures already in place. Uh, the, the spokesperson mm. for the Secretary of State said, quote, if the PhDs don't like being put in the same category as the pillow salesman, tough noogies, they should stop saying <laughs> thing thing. Now, I have a real issue. I, I don't have a PhD, but I, I know many smart people who do and work in elections and technology. And, and the point is this, um, we are all on the same side. So if somebody who's running an elections management body is uncomfortable with an, a, a vulnerability being, being highlighted or being disclosed, by somebody in academia, for example, um, th they need to get over themselves. They really do. Um, there's a difference. There's a, a significant difference between, and this, I suppose, this is. I'll finish on this thought. But there's a difference between a, a vulnerability and the exploit of that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. The mere existence of a vulnerability, for me, doesn't meet the um, the, the the probable cause point that Manuel Wally made. Um, you need to go a little further and, and demonstrate that that, 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 that that vulnerability was there and we are ready to prove that that was exploited. Uh, but again, systems that where you can audit and prove or disprove uh, that, that the exploit of the, mm -hmm. of the is important. But yeah, there, there, there needs to be greater collaboration between uh, uh, um, neutral, meaning um, non-partisan stakeholders. Uh, and that includes international and, and regional and citizen observer groups. It includes, uh, you know, uh, responsible media stakeholders, uh, and of course, political parties have have their role to play as well. But there needs to be far greater um, engagement in order for everyone to learn more and and we counter the, the disinformation. Great, thank you. Um, I'll turn to Judge uh, Tunheim next. I, I met Judge Tunheim at a world justice forum event um and there was a side it was lawyers judges there was a side event about elections and this was before elections were such a big issue actually as they are now and the discussion at the time was you know we really should come up with standards that apply to elections <laughs> and this is just this wasn't that long ago you know and I, and, and the, the folks in the room didn't realize that all the work that had been done for 20 years prior um and you know i i was there about ready to explode and judge dude i've stepped in and helped with some of that discussion but i'll always remember that because it was such a it was such an example of this lack of communication between the legal community the judges academics practitioners in this world um you know what are your thoughts on that judge do you still see that as a problem do you think there's things we ought to do um, because we do have things to learn from one another, but we seem to be a very isolated in our in our communities. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the more communication, the better. I mean, I I find that I can learn uh, from academics often. Uh, there are wonderful uh, law review articles that are really academically created that can give me a lot of information that I wouldn't normally 
actually see uh, from lawyers who are arguing one side or the other in a case. So I think the idea of standards is a wonderful idea. And I, I point to, uh, you know, our problems in the United States where we have you know, 50 different electoral systems more if you uh, include our territories. Uh, and we have a federal uh, overview of that that isn't that much of an overview. So we have different standards in different places and that's hard for people to understand. The, uh, the guidelines provided by the Help America Vote Act, which is about 15 years old now, uh, has helped a lot because that gives the states the idea of what other states are doing. States work together uh, fairly well, but we're still far away from uh, the, the kind of standards that uh, can assure people that everything is done properly. We still have voting machines where software is probably improperly updated. Uh, we have uh, hacking risks that uh, are well known. We have some criminal cases that are uh, brought, have been brought in the United States against foreign hackers to election machines in the United States, cases that haven't been resolved. Uh, so uh, I, I think there are uh, issues that can be addressed by standards. Standards worldwide for dem democracies would be a really good idea, even if it's just in the form of guidelines that uh, I, I know IFAS has done a lot of work in this area, and I think it's very important because we all need to be communicating in a way that, that helps us all do our work better. And judges and lawyers who are handling these cases are no exception. We're not on an island. We need to work with everybody else. Great, thank you. And Justice Vasiga, so the last question, you know, what are your thoughts about how the judiciary is interacting with civil society, with universities, and others. Um, and do you think there's more that can be done there, especially in this understanding of the, the complex environment we're in? Uh, many times uh, the judiciary is isolated as, 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 or at least they're perceived as being isolated, even if they are not. Um, what are your thoughts on how these communities can, can talk together? And do you have any specific examples of where academics could help you in your work? Thank you very much, very good suggestion. Here in Kenya, we've been very open in allowing the civil society, academics uh, to interact with judges, uh, legal researchers, uh, make suggestions. Uh, in fact, in the last uh, cycle of elections, uh, particularly in the Supreme Court, we saw uh, both sides uh, bring their experts, even in technology uh, professors, uh, to make contributions. Now, one other thing that I need to mention uh, about our, our um, what the Judiciary Committee on uh, Election does is that after every election cycle, we bring together uh, all these players, including civil society, academics, uh, judges, magistrates, uh, the electoral management body to do what we call debriefs. And we critique mm. each and every aspect of uh, the elections and we pick all the lessons learned and uh, we try to fill in all the gaps and ask ourselves as a country, what lessons do we need uh, to learn moving forward? And we, by my committee records and uh, we document that and we circulate this information to members of parliament, to all the leading political parties, to the civil society, to universities, and we are able to make a uh, um, uh, um, united contribution and say that this is what we think we need to do uh, moving forward in, uh, in, in this uh, uh, electoral matters. I think it's very important for uh, the civil society, for acad the academia, and each and every person who has a specialized knowledge in these matters to be allowed to make a contribution. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. And I think that you know, I think that turns, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give some concluding remarks. And, and uh, before I do, I just want to really thank the panel. Um, I could discuss these things for hours. I think some people in the audience has heard me do so. I don't want to overstay my welcome on this, but uh, the subject's so important. And I, I really do appreciate the panel that we have today and the time that we, we've taken. I, I want to say that um, just very quickly, IFAS is uh, developing a, a curriculum for judges uh, on, on technology. 
Um, some of it's built on the work we've done in Nigeria and Kenya and other places. Uh, and also another thing for this audience, just so that you're aware, um, as lawyers often look at other cases to try to inform the way they decide cases or the way judges decide cases or the way we argue cases, there, is, there hasn't been an international database on electoral judgments available. Um, but we, IFAS, there is a legit election judgment uh, database that we have now that is trying to compile all these judgments around the world on specific issues so that people can look at how courts are dealing with this. So just something for the, for the academics to be aware of. Um, so I do think in closing, I think one thing that we've learned is, I mean, judges are being asked to do, as I said in the beginning, you know, they're being asked to fix a process that may have been broken or there may have been a problem and bring some uh, conclusion to, to an electoral process. Um, and I think it's a huge ask. And I think that we need to, we being practitioners and academics need to help judges do their jobs better. And that is provide them the information they need to make uh, really solid decisions. Um, I think this idea of the burden of production for the state and EMBs and others is something we really need to explore. I think this idea of what are effective remedies um, and how you balance those remedies with, you know, rights such as the First Amendment that Judge Thun Thunheim suggested. Um, you know, how do we, how do remedies become effective but not go too far? How are remedies not used um, actually as a weapon against future candidates? You know, I think we have to be very careful in how we deal with these things. And I think technology, when we're implied, when we're using technology in an electoral process, there's so many. I love this idea that Ronan uh, suggested about just because there's a vulnerability in the technology doesn't mean that it's actually been taken advantage of and is affecting the outcome of the election. Although many times that distinction is not made. So I think we, uh, as folks who are making recommendations for election law reform or, or procedural reform, we need to think about that from the beginning. Is the technology fit for purpose? Is there time to implement it? Do, is the funding available? Is there proper transparency training? Will evidence be made available so that people can make these discussions? And, and as, as Justice Basinga said, and I think was a great way to close, is are we learning? Are we learning from this process, constantly learning from this process, not just from within our own closed communities, but across you know, the legal community, academics, and practitioners? Um, so I really do appreciate the panel today. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, and I hope this will start uh, new conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.